In this video, we will do a deep dive on the Mutual TLS handshake used by Vitter's Precision Access on the TLS suite shown here. Let's start at the very beginning by initializing the PKI Certificate Authority. The Certificate Authority is one of the components of the SDP controller. In this example, we'll use a dedicated public key infrastructure for this instance of the software-defined perimeter. Therefore, our issuing CA will be self-signed. Vitter also supports signing of the controller's issuing CA by an enterprise intermediate CA, but that just adds complexity. So we'll stick to an example of using a PKI that is dedicated to the software-defined perimeter. First, we bring up the Certificate Authority application. The CA will generate an asymmetric key pair and create an X509 certificate with the subject name and issuer name being the same. This is the definition of a self-signed CA and it will only exist on the root CA. Next, the public key is put on the certificate. A hash is taken of the whole certificate and the hash is encrypted with a private key of the CA. The encrypted hash is referred to as a signature. The final steps involve turning on an online certificate status protocol responder and having it get the certificate revocation list from the certificate authority. Now our CA is set up. Next, we set up the controller. The controller generates a key pair and issues a certificate signing request to the CA by sending the controller's public key to the CA. The CA generates a certificate with a subject name of the controller and the issuer being the CA. The CA puts the controller's public key in the certificate, hashes the certificate, and encrypts the hash with the CA's private key. The CA returns the certificate to the controller and sends the CA's root certificate to the controller too. The latter is the root of trust for the PKI environment. Finally, we need to initialize the client. In this case, the controller will make a certificate signing request on behalf of the client such that the CA will generate the keys and the certificate and put them in an encrypted P12 file so they can be transported secretly to the client. The client unwraps them and stores the private key in the certificate store as non-exportable and non-viewable. Okay, with that in place, we are ready to begin the connection from the client to the controller. The client is the fully qualified domain name of the controller, which can either be a DNS name or an IP address. If the former, then the client will first do a DNS lookup. At this point, we will assume the client now has the IP address of the controller. Therefore, the client starts with a TCP connection to the controller. Not shown is the possible interception of the connection by a forward proxy, which may require authentication. However, we will ignore that for now. So the next step is a single packet authorization, which must occur within a couple seconds or else the TCP connection will be dropped. To create the single packet authorization, we take an SSL client hello message and replace the client random number with a single packet authorization value and send that to the controller. Now the controller will accept a real SSL connection. Therefore, now we will start the mutual TLS handshake beginning with the real client hello in which the client sends a bunch of information to the server. The first piece of information is the highest version of SSL TLS the SDP client supports. For the Vitter SDP client this will always be TLS 1.2. The second is the list of TLS ciphers the client supports. As you saw in a previous video, Vitter supports a very, very secure TLS cipher. Third is the session ID, which will always be zero for initiating new sessions. The fourth is the client random number consisting of four bytes of the present time and 28 bytes of random bits. Finally, the client tells the server that it wants the OCSP response stapled to the server hello message. That sets up for the server hello. Based on the cipher suite Vitter uses, part of the server hello will be the server's Diffie-Hellman composite number. Therefore, the server must randomly generate the point beta on the suite's elliptic curve and apply that to the generator G. 
The server hello also requires a stapled OCSP response. Therefore, the controller sends the controller's certificates, serial number, and a couple of other things to the OCSP responder. Assuming the certificate has not been revoked, a message, not an X509 certificate, will be created and signed. Here, we show it being signed by the CA. This is true of a local OCSP responder. For remote OCSP responders, it would have to have its own private key and certificate. The server is about to send the server exchange message, therefore must assemble that message, including the Diffie-Hellman composite number and some additional data to create some randomness, which is turned into a signature. With that information in place, the server sends its server hello. The first piece of information in the message is the selected version number. You would expect Bitter to only allow version 1.2, but in the real world, there are a number of network elements that won't pass version 1.2. Therefore, the whole Precision Access instant is configurable as to whether or not it should allow version 1.1 or version 1.0. Next, as mentioned previously, it defines the cipher Bitter supports for this SDP instance, one that can be customized, but one that is always very, very cryptographically secure. The third thing is a session number, which is a random value. The fourth is the server's random number in the same format as the client's. After the server hello, the controller sends down its certificate and the signed OCSP response and the server exchange message and the server done message, which in the case of the mutual TLS includes the request of the client to provide its certificate with a message encrypted with its private key, which we'll see in a minute. As part of the certificate request, it stipulates the certificate wants to see is one signed by the same route as the controller certificate. Now, the client must verify the controller certificate. First, it takes a hash of the controller certificate using the hashing algorithm specified on the certificate. Then, it uses the root certificate's public key to decrypt the signature and reveal the hash that the issuing CA performed initially. Then it compares those two hashes. If they are equal, then it has verified that the certificate is valid. It also checks the validity time to make sure the certificate has not expired. Now it must make sure the certificate has not been revoked by checking that the stapled OCSP response says it is good. Hence, the certificate has not been revoked and the client can now trust the controller certificate. Next, it checks to make sure the Diffie-Hellman composite number is valid by what else? Checking the hash values of the message. Given that they are equal, it now has the controller's Diffie-Hellman composite number. Continuing with the handshake, the client must generate its random starting point on the elliptic curve, alpha, and apply it to the generator G. Then, it sends its certificate to the controller and sends up its Diffie-Hellman composite number. The next thing it does is kind of interesting. It takes all the text that has been sent and received, providing a good deal of randomness, and hashes it and encrypts it with its private key and sends it to the controller. Back on the controller, it verifies the validity of the client's certificate. Then requests an OCSP response and verifies it such that it knows the client certificate can be trusted. After that, it gathers up all the text that have been previously sent and received, decrypts what the client thinks the hash value of that text using the client's public key, which therefore could only have been encrypted with the client's private key, and compares the hashes. Being equal, the server now has the client's Diffie-Hellman composite number. Okay, we have established mutual trust. Therefore, it's time to derive the final elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman shared key, and from that, derive the TLS session keys. We are done with a good bit of stuff on this slide, so we can simplify things a little. Recall that the client randomly generated the value alpha and receive beta applied to the generator from the controller. With that, the client applies alpha to that value to determine the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman shared key. And the controller 
randomly generated the value beta and received alpha applied to the generator from the client. With that, the controller applies beta to that value to determine the elliptic curve to Phi-Hellman shared key. An elliptic curve exists in two-dimensional space, and the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman shared key has both an x and a y value to that point. The pre-master key is the x value. The master key Km is created from a pseudo-random function applied to the pre-master key, concatenated with the text master secret and the client's random number and the controller's random number. Note that the pseudo-random function is defined by the TLS suite, and for the software-defined perimeter it is SHA-384. Iterating through that function, we get the client's AES-256 symmetric key, the controller's key, the client's initialization vector, and the server's initialization vectors. These will be used by the Galois counter mode to encrypt and authenticate the data being transmitted between the client and the controller. But, not before we finish the handshake. From where we left off, the client was still sending message to the controller, and now it sends the change cipher spec message to the controller indicating that it is ready to change from plain text mode yes all this has been in plain text to encrypted mode but it needs to authenticate itself once again therefore it gathers up all the text that has been both sent and received so far signs it and sends it to the controller the controller decrypts the hash and compares it to its version of the text that has been sent and received to make the sure the integrity of the message has not been compromised and finally the server is ready to convert to encrypted communications, so it sends its change cipher spec message to the client and gathers up all the text and signs it and sends it to the client, which verifies it. And at that point, the mutual TLS connection has been established. As you can see, it's really quite simple and yet powerful too.